Renika Williams. How are you? I am good. How are you? Oh, you know, the sun is shining. The wind is blowing. It's winter is upon us. Oh, my God. It's so cold. Like, <laughs> and you know what's crazy is I say it every year, like, dang, it's cold. But, yeah. like, that's what happens. Like, in- Yes. Yeah. It happened so much faster this year somehow, or like suddenly, even though we knew like we're in December, this is when it's supposed to happen, but we had such a long fall. Yeah, that never happens here. Like it was feeling good. It was like 50s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but now my dog, like she hates going outside. I'm like, bro, you're a dog. Like, you <laughs> <love that. laughs> And yet you remember like we've socialized you to sit on my couch and watch Netflix with me. Go- Every time, every time she pees, after she pees at seven a.m., she literally expects to get on the bed like for another hour or two. Like, she, like and when you say no, no, Bailey, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like who who runs this home? Because clearly, it's not me. Clearly, yeah, she runs. Yeah, it. yeah. Clearly, I might pay rent, but I know when I'm putting my jacket on my dog that, <laughs> like, I look at him and I'm like, your clothing is really nice right her sir. coat's better than mine like it's like lined yeah. with fur like, yeah i'm like you have literal fur and now you have a coat lined with fur like we are no thank you they need jobs honestly they need jobs <laughs> <laughs> I'm like i'm gonna put them to work there's like a chore wheel I'm like today today you're on washing dishes i don't care if you only really don't have actual fingers to do it you figure it out yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> but there are babies Oh, oh, I mean, literally the only reason I get up in the morning most days is because of I look at you and I'm like writing in my gratitude journal of everything else is a mess. It's like the only thing I look at this dog and I'm like, I would. I love you more than I ever knew. I mean, you came out of my body. I birthed you. So that's what it feels like. So I get it now. I wasn't a dog person before I got Bailey, but now I'm like, she's Mm. my baby. Ugh. Um, well, for anybody, I mean, I can keep talking about dogs. We totally can go down this. But for anybody who is listening who does not know who you are, who are you today? Who am I today? I, mm, first thing that comes to my mind, I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a friend. I'm an artist. Mm-hmm. I'm a storyteller. I'm trying to be super intentional about the energy and the spaces that I share. That's mm-hmm. really been big for me in this season. I know that sounds so like, oh, like everybody says that, but no, Mm -hmm. energy is like real. Mm -hmm. And like my peace is worth more than most things actually. And so I'm I'm trying to be intentional about how I protect my energy and my peace and not apologizing for that because I'm working on not being a people pleaser. So I was going to say I could be a people pleaser, but I'm working on not being. So I'm going to say I'm intentional. Oof. Even the way that you, even the way you shared that held intention, you thought about it, you sat with it. I like felt you feel it in your body. Mm. Ooh. So like, talk about practicing what you're preaching. Yes. Therapy. Listen, <laughs> listen, it's not in my insurance, which that's a whole other story because that's a nightmare, but every single dollar that I pay towards that is worth my investment, I will Listen, say. My therapist doesn't even take insurance. Same. And that's how great she is that I'm like, girl, take my money. Because mm-hmm. my growth, I started working her with her in October 2021. And even the way I communicate now yeah. in my different relationships is like so different. Mm-hmm. And so boundaries cool. are like huge for me now. And I realized that I never had them Because my no was never respected. I know that sounds weird. But you know how when you're like a kid and let's say like your grandparent says like, say hi to this person. Give them a hug. What if I didn't want to give that person a hug? Or like, I know that sounds super like. No, but it's relatable. Yeah. And it's just like, I realized that like, I never felt like I could say no. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like that was because there were external expectations around like what you were quote unquote, supposed to do? Or do you feel like it was just this thing that internally you wanted to go, going back to your words, like a people pleasing moment of you just wanted to make other people happy over yourself? I feel like people pleasing was what got me attention. Mm. I often felt really overlooked growing up. I have a brother who's like, if you met my brother, he is like, like everybody loves him. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like when I when I grew up and I went to high school, people were like, oh my God, you're Regis' little sister. You know, like he was like yeah. a big shot, right? And I felt like people pleasing was my way that I got attention. Like the reason I worked so hard in school and like got all A's was because that's what got my parents' attention mm-hmm. or being the president of this club or like being the overworker that said, yes, 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 I can do these things is what got me the recognition that mm-hmm. I feel like I was not getting. Mm-hmm. And so now as an adult, when it comes to someone inviting me somewhere and I don't feel like it, I used to feel bad about saying no. Yeah. And I was like, no, I, re- I, I do not have the capacity for that social event. I can't, like, but the old me would have went, yeah. been socially burned out, mm-hmm. irritated at myself because I didn't rest the way that I needed to. And so I'm just in a space of like genuinely trying to put myself in my peace first. Ugh. And I would imagine by doing so, when you show up, you are showing up because you want to be there. And then by association, every single person who is in that space with you gets to actually see and experience you fully, not like the obligated version of you who showed up yeah. because you thought you had to go. Yeah, I hope so. I feel like I've done a lot of doing things that I thought I had to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then also realizing that when you say no, most times people are like, okay. Yeah. We talked about this with Denise on an earlier episode um, that was talking about boundaries and that um, no is a yes. And it's a boundary. Is, it's, it's a door, not a wall. And both of those things living kind of simultaneously in that me saying no to you is you then receiving the fact that me saying no is actually giving you the space and the full understanding of the scope of what is. (laughs) As in like, cool, this person is no longer coming. This person is no longer able to. How then can I live my life adjust accordingly? It's a yes for you to then make your own choices instead of the ambiguity or the like obligation thing that then there's actually more tiptoeing and also the like boundaries being this door, not a wall, recognizing that perhaps you say no in this moment. And then later you actually realize like, no, I, I, I think I can now and I'd love to. Mm-hmm. And it was not firm. It wasn't solid in the ground. It was this thing that at some point can be opened if it wanted to, but for now it's shut until yep. it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it's okay that I won't be punished for it. I don't know why I have these, like, as a kid, I had these big thoughts like, oh, if I say no or if I don't do this, like, there's a punishment. There's no punishment. Like, you're saying yes to yourself. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I do – I mean, I'm not a therapist in any way. You know, like you saying, like, you don't know why. I would argue that society just generally – You know, there's expectations and certainly when we're talking about various intersectionalities of identity, when we're talking about different, you know, economics and backgrounds and religions and I mean, like gender and race and I mean, all of those things, like there are reasons that we are the way that we are that don't necessarily come directly from within us. It's taught to us. We've been systemically taught certain things that we have to unlearn, you Mm -hmm. know, I'm so grateful for this intentional intro um, because I feel like when you and I first, first of all, we've never actually met in real life still. Which is crazy. And I feel like I we also met on StreamYard. Is was it a stream or a Zoom? It was like a StreamYard or a Zoom. It was a, it yeah. was a virtual space. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was doing a reading with Lamar Perry, who's one of the most mm-hmm. intentional artists, I would argue. Um, mm-hmm. and in a space that required intentionality. And I was like, this girl like in the little Zoom box or whatever. And I think, I don't know, I like messaged you and I was like, can, I, can we like be friends? Like, like, yes. I think we called you, did we call you Pastor Apple? There, you were like, <laughs> You were like preaching. You talk about being intentional that whole week of rehearsals. Like you were just dropping gems. No, yeah, I... 2020 was weird, but I feel like I met some really great people, even if it was only virtually. Yeah, same. And I've just, you know, I've been watching you and your journey, um, you know, through what 
is presented, I'll put it at the, put it that way, what is presented on social media, which is all a curated space, right? We need to yeah. remind ourselves that that's what that is for better or for worse. And, you know, by osmosis, it makes me really proud, happy, excited to see all that you're doing and the way that you are doing it. And so I'm really, I'm, it just is, it feels really right that you would put yourself into this space the way that you did. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm curious kind of how it all started for you in terms of the artistry of it all, the performing aspect of it all. Obviously, you were sharing earlier just, you know, in order for you to be seen, you had to do the things, quote unquote, right or in a way that people looked at you. But in terms of like the creative part of it, how did that all begin for you? I was really shy as a kid. I feel like every artist has this story. I don't know why. Own yours. I'm asking you. Take up your space. <laughs> I was so quiet. Like, and I was always afraid to say like how I felt. Mm -hmm. But something about writing, I used to write for my friends to perform in these like plays. Oh my gosh. And then I started like making myself the lead. Yes, you did. Uh, but <laughs> you're like, um, I'm writing, so I get to make yeah. the decision. I am oh, the why lead. not? Yeah. Exactly. So I think it started to help me find my voice. Uh, I come from a super like, athletic family, but sports was never my thing. Did you play sports? Even though... Girl, I quit every sport I ever played. Like, literally every sport. And, like, it wasn't like a... I have this thing, you know, when you, you know, when you get older and you start to kind of like examine your childhood and like the way your parents raised you, oh, yeah. I, love my parents. I have wonderful parents, but one thing that's my critique is that they let me quit. Yo, tell yours. I tell mine. Go, go, go. <laughs> yeah. They let me quit. And like, it's one thing to be like, okay, you don't want to play basketball anymore. Mm -hmm. Finish this season and you never have to play again. Mm -hmm. My parents would be like, okay. And like mm -hmm. like mid season, and and I know it's because so my parents are older. They had me. My dad was forty six when I was born, and so like uh, I was there last. And so I think that like they had this new awakening of like don't do anything you don't love, yeah. which I'm totally for. But I I learned that I was a quitter. I was mm -hmm. a quitter. And the only thing I never quit were were my plays in theater. I never wow. quit. Yeah, but I, they said that's how they knew that that's what I wanted to do. Is long story short, I love that. I um, <laughs> this is the, I always come at my parents about this thing. They let me quit piano, um, and it's like, what younger kid wants to practice piano? What younger kid wants to practice any? Like, no kid has discipline. And that's the whole point of parenting to like give your kid a sense of dis. Isn't that like? I mean, I'm not a parent except for my dog, and I try to discipline him and make him do the dishes, right? Like, he's a dog, you know, and I know he's not going to do it, but like, we try. So, like, I like you letting me quit piano. Of course, I didn't want to play, and now I'm older, and that I wish you had at least like. Yeah, I would have been miserable. They're like, yeah, but you just wanted to take voice lessons and you didn't quit that. And here I am. But it's just like, yeah, but there's also a muscle about um, sustaining discomfort. Mm. Obviously, when it crosses into like unhealthy territory, yes, let your kid, please, if it's if it's bad, like, do, I mean, again, I'm not a parent, but yeah. – I think there's like, there is that muscle when you're younger that like, of course, a kid's going to throw a tamper tantrum because it wants to eat rice instead of the pasta. Yeah. Like, you got it, but you got it. There's only pasta today. So you got to eat the pasta or don't eat it all. Like, yeah. I don't. No, I, I agree with you. They, they let me quit piano in second grade. Yeah. And I was like, do you know that I could have been out here writing musicals yeah. or something like, yeah. and they were like, well, you just didn't want to do it. Right. I know, of course I didn't want to do it. I was a child. I didn't want to do homework either. Like, no, yeah. So it's just like I th that balance, even though I, I do believe that everything works out how it's supposed absolutely. to. Absolutely. I'm a big believer of that. And the, I get what they were saying, like, you never quit theater. Mm -hmm. And that's how we knew that's what you wanted to do. I feel that. But I, as an adult, when I'm on that Peloton bike over there, <laughs> that quitter in me be like, <laughs> 
I'm done. <laughs> right. I'm done. And I'm like, girl, no, you're not that eight year old anymore. But no, I, I've quit a lot in my life and I'm not proud of it, but no, but I, I, I'm going to like challenge that. And maybe this is like me having listened to a lot of Glennon Doyle's podcast, which I mean, I, I'm, I listen to religiously and I've listened to every single episode, but there are a lot of episodes about quitting and the language around quitting. And I'm not going to say it properly, but the origin of the word quit is not what we actually use it for now. The word quit comes from Latin, which means to release, to discharge, to let go. As in, we have commandeered this word quit to have these negative connotations rather than it's a release. Mm -hmm. Like there's actually something really beautiful about that mm -hmm. to let go of something that in theory, and maybe that was like the se this season of your life. And now it's this next season of your life. Society has like, again, commandeered this word and turned it into this nasty thing of you quit the thing. No, yes. I didn't. I let it go. I released it and made space for what I wanted to do next. That part. That you just might have helped heal something because this whole time I'm like, I've spent most of my life as a quitter until no. recently. No, but. You haven't. You've been releasing things. Whether I think maybe the difference is perhaps it's been whether it's more intentional release or whether it's like unintentional subconscious release of this isn't serving me. Yeah. Right. It's, you know, I, I don't know. In my brain, there's this idea of like, to quit, to quit something, to choose to quit something, to choose to release something, to choose to let go of something means that something had to have happened internally or externally that impacted me so deeply that I could no longer sustain what was. Something had to shift. So the onus then becomes this thing for oneself of like, how can I then choose to be intentional about whether I want to keep it happening or not. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a form of faith. Yeah. Like having faith that, okay, that no longer serves me. Yeah. And I'm making space for something that could better serve me in yeah. this season. Mm -hmm. I used to think everything was black and white. I'm not going to lie. I really did. But then I grew up and realized that, you know, like everything's not black and white there are yeah. other spaces there are gray spaces and like I used to be like, oh something's working where it's not I'm like no right. there are like different yeah. moments and like I do believe that we have to create space when a moment changes I'm allowed to change my mind mm -hmm. about how I feel about something how I want to present myself I'm allowed to change my mind yeah so at any point at any point at any point yeah Agreed. Agreed. There's also this concept of like, and I'm going to like hold up my hand for anybody who's looking at the YouTube, but if not, like there's this concept, like, let's say this is your life, right? It's all like on my hand and you have a little box up here that's for your family and a box over here that's for your friends and a box that's for your job and a box that's for your home and a box that's for your obligations and a box that's for your travel and about like all the different boxes of your life if you were to compartmentalize all your life. And so often people are like, well, I really want more of this in my life. I'll just do like a minor little change and they'll take a small little sliver from like the corner of like like family and, you know, they'll remove that and hope that that's going to shift things enough to create space for this new thing rather than like, you know what, I'm going to trust. I'm going to have faith that if I remove for a period of time, a really substantial chunk of maybe a bit of a lot or one of the major chunks, I'm going to actually have a lot of room for this new thing to take up some space, see how it sits in this amalgamation of my whole life. And then that create some sort of like tectonic shift for all of it, which actually yeah. creates larger shifting mm -hmm. and growth. And it's really scary mm -hmm. to like trust that you can remove and yes. put in. Yes. It's really scary, but it's also freeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's also the space that I'm in. I feel like I'm in a space of like, I think I want to take a leap. And even if like for a second, I'm like, is that, leap premature mm. like I'm in a really good space uh, career wise mm -hmm. but I still have major goals mm -hmm. and like how do I continue to climb and not get comfortable mm -hmm. because I don't like to feel comfortable yeah how do you sense in yourself when you are 
too comfortable. I don't feel challenged. Mm -hmm. I want to feel challenged. Internally, or does that require some external something to to make that challenge moment percolate? I um, I call myself a storyteller, and I think I could be a better storyteller because I think it's time for me to start writing for myself again. Mm. Because for me, it feels like I'm waiting for someone to write something for me mm. that makes me feel challenged in my work. I think as artists, it's just tough, right? Because we need to eat and we yeah. need to pay rent. And there are a lot of gatekeepers that get in the way of a lot of artists eating and paying rent. Mm -hmm. But I think once you get past that first big gatekeeper and you're like, wow, I have my food and I have my rent. But for the first time in my career, I'm feeling is unchallenged a word? I'm not feeling challenged. Yeah. Is it more like, this is a terrible example, maybe. Um, you thought you really wanted sushi. And so you mm -hmm. went to what you thought was like, or you were actually invited to this really incredible sushi place. And you're sitting mm -hmm. there and you're having your sushi. And while you're having your sushi, you realize like, no, I actually really wanted like just an Asian fusion place with sushi options and also some like Thai food and also some Indian food. Like I actually, so like once you were there, you realized that maybe what you thought was what you wanted wasn't actually what you thought you wanted. Or is it more like once you were there, you realized there's far more than just the sushi? That is a really great example. Is it, am I allowed to say a little bit of both? Yeah, there's a, this is there's no right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's a little bit of both. I feel like it's like it's not what you thought it would be, mm -hmm. right? But then it's also like you realize that there's so much more at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, Could you have made that discovery without being invited to the thing? No. So you kind of, in some ways, needed the thing to happen, though, for you oh, to yeah, have that. For sure. I for sure needed this experience. I for sure needed this experience. I feel yeah. like we don't talk about it enough. I don't know. I feel like there has to be more reaching back in our field than there and is. Tell me more what you mean by that. Not like, how can I say this? You know how like, okay, let's just get into it. You know how sometimes, let's say you have a friend that like uh, books a big job. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, that friend still can't get you a job. Does it make it like they? I think when you're a kid, you think like, oh, once they, I don't know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. oh, once they do it, if you're not friends with Jay Z, <laughs> Jay Jay could get me a job. Does it make sense? Like, right, right, right. You're my uncle, he could give me a job. But like your friend who who books Netflix for the first time or Showtime or whatever, they can't like get you a job. What I mean by reaching back is sharing. Mm -hmm. about the experience and I think for me I I didn't know that there were levels to being a series regular did you know that not I don't think the way that you're referring to it then no girl I didn't either okay so <laughs> <laughs> there is something called a fractional series regular how is that different than say a recur glad you asked okay so Series regular is like, just series regular mm -hmm. is, let's say there are 10 episodes, 10 out of 10. Oh, mind you, 10 out of 10, but like the studio and the network, they kind of own you. Um, Contractually because you've signed on to be a series regular. Yes. Yeah, so however many long, how many years it says in your contract, like if we go five seasons, we have rights over this actor. 10 out of 10. It's it's their show. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll skip to recur so that I can come back to fractional yeah. series regular. Recur is, you can recur for two to nine episodes. You know, it's not um, a season contract. It's per episode. You tend to make less because they don't have that 
ownership over you. Now, they don't like to call it ownership. They like to call it options. I don't know why. Words hold meaning. Words hold meaning. <laughs> so options. They don't have the options on you. So let's say, um, for instance, like my partner, he recurs on two shows. He could do that at the same time. It was amazing. He just got to flip back and forth. But when you're a series regular, you can't be a series regular on another show at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can recur. Got it. If you're a recur, you can be a series regular somewhere else. But you can't be a series regular two other places. Right. Fractional is this thing that I didn't know existed. So it's usually like a 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, season contracts. It's not your show, but I consider it like a supporting regular situation. They still have all these rights over you, though. So they're like, we have you, we want you. Versus mm -hmm. if I were to recur on a show right now, instead of a fractional series regular, if they were to call, let's say we're shooting next summer and I book something else. If they were to call, they would have to work around that. Right. But because... They have these rights over me. They get first dibs. So everything else comes second to them. So I can't audition for other series regulars. Only recurs in movies. Um, and this is not just me, mind you. This yeah, is yeah, literally like everybody's contract. So it's like it has its pros and cons, right? Because you're getting paid like a regular. Well, not as much as like top, top, top. Mm -hmm. You're getting paid like a regular. You have... A set number, seven out of 10. I know I'm going to be in seven out of 10. So you knew that number from the get for this particular contract too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they like, uh, now mm, they have to pay you for seven out of 10. You don't have to actually be in seven out of 10. Okay. But it also has nothing to do the, with the capacity to which they write for you. I do think that you have to play chess. And so decisions that I can make today, I don't think I could have made two years ago. Like, yeah, a dis that decision probably would have been premature for whatever reason. You know what I'm saying? And now it's like, okay, you have some quote unquote leverage under your belt. And you're like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I do think that sometimes we as actors have to take a job. Mm -hmm. or sign you know what I'm saying? As long as it's not like hurting you, you know, like and going against your morals and values. Like if you had to take a job that may not be exactly what you want it to be, like I I had to do that and I and I feel like a lot more people have to do that than you think. Yeah. And yeah. mind you, to me, the sex lives of college girls is a great first step in. I'm okay. gonna be honest. It's like I think people like it. I think uh, it's becoming its own hit show, and I'm really grateful to be a part of it. It's just a big show. Like, if you watch it, like, there are a lot of characters. You know what I'm saying? It's hard mm -hmm. for anybody to get screen time in 28 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. But, like, it's definitely a great first step. I'll be honest. Like, that's not something that I regret um, at all. I And it's a lot of fun. It, it, it's a show that is fun, and it's not... Um, it's fun for me. I, I know everybody has different like levels. You know what I'm saying? Like different levels. I mean, of your levels. character, you <laughs> you come in there with these zingers that are so <laughs> your timing is impeccable. Impeccable. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. And to talk about like in a 28 minute situation when you do have these short little clips, like if you yeah. don't make these things count, like and you do, like you take up the real estate that you are given fully and beautifully and you know i i can only imagine that the lived experience offset behind the scenes at home feels different than you know perhaps what we end up seeing in an edit but yeah. it's landing i will tell you that not just because i like you and i think you're an incredible actor but like you are you are making an actual impression like anybody who watches that show knows willow Thank you. That honestly, that does mean a lot because I think is that what imposter syndrome is? Yes. Okay. Because I I struggle with that. 
Yeah. It's like feeling like no matter where you are, you don't somehow belong. Like if you, I mean, I don't know if that's the actual definition I can go on to, you know, Google and pull that up, but right. To feel like an imposter, to feel like you aren't meant to be in that space, to feel Wait, like Wait, is somehow... that what that means? Then that's not it. Let me tell you what I feel. And then you <laughs> put a name on it. I actually do believe I belong. Yeah. But I actually feel like an underdog. Ah, ex- explain no. what you mean by that emotionally. Like, maybe it's my everything stems from childhood, right? Maybe mm-hmm. it's that feeling of being overlooked and excluded. Um, so to me, this moment in my life, in my career, does not feel as big of a deal as it probably should. Mm-hmm. And I hate mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. I do. Um But I think it is because of what you just said, like, well, I'm only in it for 30 seconds. I'm only in it for two minutes at most. Doesn't make sense. But like, I think that's undermining my own accomplishment. And I've been working on that. If I'm honest, it's something I work on. I'm not proud of it, but like, I think because I know what I have to offer, I do. That's something that that I do know, but I feel like it's just not my like, like moment yet. Like I was mm-hmm. in therapy a couple of weeks ago and I was telling her that I feel really disappointed that this moment in my life does not feel how I imagined it to feel. Mm. She was like, cause I told her I imagined it when I was 12 years old, I dreamt about this moment. And she was like, it's not that moment. Mm. It's a step towards that moment, but you have the moment wrong. Like, this is not that moment that you imagine. And it literally was like this big aha moment for me because I've been like, why do I feel this way? Right. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a marathon. Yeah. It's a yeah. long game. And it's, it's a great step. It is. Like I said, I'm really great to be grateful to be a part of it. But I do know that there's more to offer. And I know that other people know too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But also, not that you need me to affirm the work that you're doing or to, you know, sing your praises, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's the phrase like, there is no small actor or there's no small parts, only small actors. That yeah, there's yeah. There are, yeah, the phrase, there are no small parts, only small actors. Mm-hmm. And I was always like, that's such a degrading <laughs> phrase. But the energy around that holds in that. When have you ever seen a show where there is like an ensemble and there is that person in that ensemble who doesn't have a line, but you, they are living with a capital L, their dance, like talk about dancing from the tip of their toes to the top of their head and beyond. Like they are embodied. They are full. You watch them and only them. And they had not said a single word that was their own. (laughs) And that you leave that, you leave that theater being like, yo, that person stole the show. Stole the show. Yeah. Like, yeah. And and what's I mean, you can say like, oh, well, they didn't have much to do and it, it wasn't about them. Sure. Okay. In the context of like what is actually happening on that stage, maybe. But for my money, when you see a fully embodied artist doing what they do best, whether it's small, whether it's in the background, whether it's just a clip and a thing and they exit, like they're noticed. Because they were fully present and they were doing their version of storytelling and it came through because it was honest and vulnerable and available. And for my money, I want to see that rather than the lead who is phoning it in just because they are paid more. Yeah. You know? So why I bring that up is because, yeah, maybe this, I think your therapist framing it in that way is so beautiful because hopefully it's a release of like these expectations that we all have for these big things in our lives and picturing how it's going to go and what it's going to be. And truly nothing is ever the way we think it's going to be. Um, yeah. But anybody, anybody who watched the show will know your character. You make an impression. impression. Like there's no, we know who you are um, and you have embodied it so clearly And you have such a specific point of view that you make a dent in every moment that you are there. So again, you don't need me like affirming you and your worth. No, but but I really appreciate it. I do. I appreciate it so much because maybe that's its own version of imposter syndrome, but I just feel like, oh yeah, 
Like that's how sometimes I feel like, oh yeah, I was there for a little bit. But when I hear people say the kind of things that you just said, it does reaffirm like, no, it, it may be exactly what you're describing. Like in quantity, yeah. smaller than someone else's, but it does not mean that I'm not making an impact or a mark. Um, yeah. For sure. And it's, just, it's, your, it's your body of work, right? Yeah. Like I think it's another thing to chalk up to, right? Which is just like, this is another facet of what you do. And hopefully, and it will happen that you will find another opportunity or it will come to you that will show even more of what you are capable of. So you know, this is just like shining a flashlight onto like this little part of it. But that doesn't mean just because you have this thing doesn't mean that it's the whole thing. No, for sure. I think that's one thing that New Amsterdam taught me. Like I got my first guest star on New Amsterdam. And when I say that I felt so empowered when I went to work on that show, like I was like challenged, like I had to prepare for work. I felt like I had to focus and the director and I were having these talks. Like it was like everything about a work day that I had imagined. Oh. And like you hear it and it, it teaches me that there is so much out there in the world, God willing for mm -hmm. me to do. Mm -hmm. And that just because on one end, I may be allowed to call one show my show and there's another where I'm a guest and those things I can gain different things from all those experiences and just I don't want to ever down anybody to ever downplay like being a co-star being a guest star when I was a co-star on Mrs. Maisel that was one of the best days I ever had in my life I had like three lines you know what I'm saying it's just like I think we think like the big moments are the only moments but it's the 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 moments that add up to that you know yeah. what I'm saying when oh, you yeah. go visit someone else's set or go do a workshop I did a reading last week and I had a wonderful day just for one day you know like I think we think the big moments are all that it's about. And it's really, it's really not. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to you, the idea of you, um, I don't forget the phrase that you used, but this was the gesture. Like, what was the phrase that you used? The... Reaching back? Yeah. You reaching back. Yeah. And are there things that you found for yourself or tools that you have that you try to use or ways of reaching back that you have found to be impactful, successful, helpful that you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, I many things. One of the biggest things is I'm a co-founder of the Uptown Collective, mm -hmm. um, which I'm really proud of. I feel like I don't talk about it enough. We Go offer it reprogramming for artists like we had a panel with casting directors that people were invited to um there was an acting class four classes in a row taught by uh someone with an mfa and who has worked and who i love very much and like we just offer like playwrights readings where we pay for the actors for the rehearsal and we give them space to continue to write their play and i feel like that's a way that i'm like how can we offer free opportunities for people in the city. I think acting classes are so expensive. I don't know what it's like to be a playwright, but like I know that's hard. And so it's one of the things I'm most proud of because I've always wanted to provide opportunities for artists as much as I can. Um, but another way is just by talking to people. The more you talk to people, the more you realize that they feel the way that you feel. Yeah. And I think when social media becomes a part of a business, um, things can appear differently than they are, right? And I try not to judge myself or other people when it comes to that, because I do know that Instagram is the new website. Like it really is. It's literally the new website. Like, yeah. what are you doing? Um, but like, we also have to keep talking to each other because the, when I share my journey, I've learned that other actors feel similar, have felt similarly or are going through something like, wow, I actually don't really feel a part of the show that I'm in. And it can be jarring, right? When you come from the theater and you're in rehearsal for three and a half weeks and you do this run with this group of people, it can be jarring when you're only invited to work 
on random days that are like over the course of five to six months, you don't feel like you're a part mm-hmm. of the cast. I, it's kind of inherent. You know what I'm saying? Like it does not feel like theater would feel. And so I think it's important to continue to reach back and just talk like, no, I understand. Like, yeah. I do understand that like it's, it can be jarring, I think, in the transition. Yeah. I think you're touching on something about community, mm-hmm. which I think many people have different definitions of what that is. Amazing. But it also like the way that that plays into industry talk of say like networking and how in order to feel like you're a part of something, you have to go into a space in perhaps a disingenuous way or perhaps like what, you know, to try to like make those connections rather than just being yourself and talking about your life experience in an honest vulnerable way with another person who's doing the same and recognizing that in those conversations, that is how you are creating community. That is how you are quote unquote networking by sharing honestly where your journey is. So then you are connecting with another human being who, if you didn't communicate in that way, you would never know that you actually are more in alignment than you thought. Yeah. I think that's what's tough for me in this moment about Los Angeles specifically is I feel like you meet somebody and they're like, well, what are you working on? And not like, how are you? Or who are you? Or, you know, um, but yeah, speaking of community, like, I think that's a transition for me too. I feel, I feel very alone these days. I don't know if it's also just like the nature of life post pandemic ish, you know, Mm -hmm. post 2020. Because everything does feel a little like, it's just, it's lonelier. You know what I'm saying? And like, I also, you know, you don't want to like put your problems on other people either. But I do think we have to continue to have these space, safe spaces to talk about what we're going through. Because it is, it's very different. Yeah. But I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with like boundaries in that way, which is, hey, I just want to be honest with you and transparent with you. I'm feeling the day and this is where my energy is at right now. I would love to talk to you. Are you in a space where you are comfortable sure. meeting that? Yeah. Like, you know, like there is a way of owning where you are and who you are in that moment, mm-hmm. meeting another human being, being honest about that, and then not asking permission necessarily, but giving a framework of like, this is where I'm at. If you're comfortable with that, this is where I can meet you. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know? because I think that is a part of the reaching back. Like we, we, I think we will all learn that we're not that different, you know, yeah. like, and yeah, things do look a certain way and you can be really blessed and really grateful and having a good time, but also not feeling that challenged and not yeah. and feeling like you want more. And that yeah. maybe, you know what I'm saying? Like I, when I go back to talking about, I used to think life was black and white. It's really not. All those things can exist together like I can be really grateful I can have a good time and I can also be like but I think I want to try for something like this that makes me feel like this you know what I'm saying like oh yeah oh yeah I literally had that exact conversation with my therapist the same honestly I could I probably said it exactly the same way too which is like I'm so grateful for x y and z and I know that I can't complain about x y and z because I'm this this and this and I have all of this and yet nothing looks the way I thought it would or nothing feels the way I think I want it to feel like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is because, you know, there was a time and, you know, I'm a big, like I'm huge on my spirituality. I think that's why we have to be specific about what we ask for Mm -hmm. because I'm not going to lie to you, Jen. Like I prayed to be a series regular. I said, God, I want to pay my rent and I want to eat. He's like, okay. But I was not specific about the kind of stories I want to tell, mm. the kind of life I want to have within that role or whatever. Does it make sense? Like, oh, yeah. So it's just like, oh, let's be specific when we're journaling. Let's be specific when we're manifesting and praying and whatever we're meditating on, we have to be specific. Yeah. I think it can get but- scary because you feel like you're niching yourself down somehow. But like, you know, whether you believe in, whether you believe in a yes. higher power, or you don't, whatever you are, whatever energy you are putting out right. and you are hoping something comes back. Right. Like if you're not getting, I mean, I'm not great at 
manifesting and I I'm envious of people who are and it feels like it works like it does for you. <laughs> like I'm definitely envious about it. Um and maybe this is my own version of imposter syndrome feeling like well what if I actually did do that and I trusted that's a huge, it's a big word to trust that there's something out there working on your behalf in some way that there's mm -hmm. something out there that like if you put it out there there is something that's listening <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's going to come back but either way it's like to really get that specific there's perhaps the fear of well then I'm maybe closing off other options that might come my way forgetting yeah. that well and I'm not practicing what I'm preaching, but well, if it comes your way, then you have the choice to say yes or no, as long as it's come to you. Right. So it's like, if you do manifest this thing that you think you want, and then it comes to you, well, if you didn't manifest it, it might not have come. And now it's here. Do you want to say yes or no? Then that is a choice that you get to make rather than like the hope that it even comes to begin yeah. with. Yes. And I think I had to experience what I experienced mm. so that I can be more specific mm. so that when I am in another space, let's say one day I'm a producer mm. that helps me curate and be a leader in those experiences. Like, Oh, I remember what it felt like on this or like on that. Let me make sure that the space that I am leading mm -hmm. is intentional in this way or whatever. I think like it was a lesson I needed to learn and I think the overarching lesson of like more than one thing can be true at the same time. Like we just mm -hmm. said, like you said to your therapist is exactly how I feel. Yeah. And that's, and that it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's more than okay. I think that's like, that's what it is to be a human being on this planet to mm -hmm. grapple with those simultaneously confusing, conflicting yeah. Feelings that how can I be so grateful and also really sad? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. yeah. You know? It's wild. I mean, it's wild, but I'm like I said, <laughs> therapy. Um <laughs> Yeah. 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 I'm I'm so honored that you have been so open and vulnerable in this space with me in this way. I know that this conversation for whoever has just listened to this would will be impactful. I know for myself, just even being able to talk in this way about these things that all humans, but more specifically artists go through, but are afraid to talk about is mm -hmm. hopefully a small little shift in beginning to change the dialogue so that we can all feel more empowered to do so in the future, mm -hmm. um, which is in and of itself showing up for each other, building community. So I'm so grateful to you for that and for being willing to show up so intentionally. Um, so thank you. No, thank you. You made me feel so safe and to be yeah. able to talk about these things. So of course. For anybody who's listening who would love to uh, reach out, work with you, collaborate, ask more questions, what within your own boundaries um, is the best way for people to find you? On Instagram at underscore Renika Danielle. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for everything. I'm so proud of you. I'm really excited for whatever you choose to have as a part of your life and your creative spirit and journey. I really, I really know in my gut and heart that because you are showing up the way that you are showing up, it's going to happen faster than you think it is. So thank you. Friend. I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate you. Thank you.